This program is brought to you by Abiding Above Ministries. Tonight, we're going to finish our series on Abiding Above Rejection. Uh, we've talked about the fact that we're all in the process of becoming inexperienced who we already are in Christ Jesus. If you know who you are in Christ Jesus, my friend, you're a long step ahead and on your way to overcoming what all human beings experience, this whole thing of uh, rejection. The question is, what is it that blocks many Christians from joy and liberty in the Christian life? What is it that veils the understanding of who you are in Christ, though maybe you've heard the teaching over and over again from some sincere, consistent uh, Bible teacher? There's a common thread that runs through the lives of most people, and it's called rejection. To reject someone is to refuse to accept them as a person and the way God made them. And you can reject a person's conduct and behavior without rejecting them as a person. Just because you get on to your children doesn't mean that you're rejecting them. It means you're rejecting their conduct and behavior. We have to be careful with our words and actions that we do not reject them as a person, only the behavior. We learn that we are a creation of God, and that God never makes duplicates, He only makes originals. We learn that you can be rejected and not know it, you can be rejected and know it, and you can feel in your emotions rejection, but not be rejected by anyone. It's just in your emotions. We talked about the fact that rejection is the absence of meaningful love. Not that you don't have anybody in your life loving you like a mom or dad, but the love that you've received from other people wasn't meaningful love. And then we talked about what self-rejection is. Once a person has gone through rejection from another, they begin what's called self-rejection. That is, the impaired ability to accept yourself. You feel unworthy to be accepted and you feel unable to be accepted. I'm unworthy, and I don't even know how to begin to be accepted. And then we talked about the results of rejection. A person who's gone through rejection has entered into self-rejection over a period of time. They have a hard time receiving love from others, and therefore they have a hard time loving other people. We talked about how rejection becomes a form of communication. In our speech, our choice of words, our choice of body language, when we relate to other people, becomes a rejective form of communicating. And most of the time, people who've been rejected are and are into full-blown self-rejection, they don't even realize that their whole body, facial expressions, choice of words, every part of their being is one of rejection, and they enter into what's called a fixation of rejection, which is called a rejection syndrome. And so, rejection uh, can be a form of manipulation, a form of control, a form of dominating. Now, I, I want to be clear that a person that's going through this, they're not necessarily mean, horrible people. A lot of times, they don't even know how they come across. They're not even aware of their presence, the way they are when they interact with other people. What I'm talking about here, it's not like these people have planned how to make everybody else's life miserable. A lot of times, until someone tells them, they don't even know that they make everyone miserable, and they create an atmosphere of misery, criticism, negative, and rejection. Wherever they are, they set the tone. And so these people are in what's called a rejection Syndrome, and somebody has to eventually sit them down and say, look, this is what you're causing and help them see it and help them begin to work in it. Rejection becomes a form of punishment. In other words, if you don't do things the way I'm telling you to do them, if you don't do things the right way, I'm going to figure out a way to punish you to prove to you that you need me because I have to control you in order to protect myself from any more rejection. We talked about those things in rejection part one. Then part two, uh, we talked about the rejection syndrome. Instead of, and, and you say, well, you're talking about a lost person. No, not necessarily. 
It could be a person who's born again. But instead of them living, moving, and having their being in Christ Jesus, the Spirit-filled life, they are the exact opposite, and they live and move and have their being in flesh, in self, and in this rejection syndrome. Many people never see the connection of rejection in their childhood for the present emotional state and social mal adjustment. You show me a household that this way, a person or persons that are in this rejection syndrome, you show me any organization, whether it's a church, whether it's a school, any kind of organization, whether it's the family hardware store, you show me a man or a woman who's in charge of any of those institutions, and I'll show you an atmosphere of rejection in that whole establishment. I don't care how small or how large it is. My friend, it defiles many. The Bible says that when we sin and when we're critical and when we lie and things like that, that it defiles many. And it's the same thing with rejection. It sets the tone for families, organizations, and uh, places like that. We talked about what Jesus said about himself in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He said, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, not to the rich. It's He says here, to the poor. And he said, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. So if you think a message like this is out of place for a local church and out of place for a pulpit, you're absolutely wrong. The Bible said the common people heard Jesus Gladly, and I believe it's because Jesus spoke on these topics along with a whole lot more. Uh, he says to heal the brokenhearted. That is the result of inner wounding. The brokenhearted, those who've been bruised, those who have been rejected. And then, biting above rejection part two, we also talked about the fact that everyone created requires love. God made all of us in such a way that we need to be loved, and that love needs to be a meaningful love. And the truth is, only God can love you and me 100% with unconditional love. A human being cannot do that, not consistently. And so, but God can. And so what happens is when a person doesn't have an intimate, ongoing fellowship with God, they live their life trying to make others love them in a way that only God can love them to begin with. And then that puts others on guard, so to speak. It makes them feel rejected because I'm trying to make you love me 100% so that I can feel satisfied inside, not realizing that he or she cannot do it. It's impossible. And so everyone God created requires love. Love is what Sunshine and rain is to a growing flower. When someone is not loved, they're rejected, is the bottom line. But not only that, everyone God created, He loves. Uh, 1 John 4, 16 tells us that. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in Him. And so, God's kingdom, God's economy is L O. V E. The Bible teaches us that God first loved us over and over again. God loved us first, and He loved us 100%. Romans 5 8, Paul says, But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't ask anything from us. The truth is, we were children of Satan dead in our trespasses and sins, alienated from God, and God in His great love, 100% love, He doesn't have love like you and I have, up one day and down the next. God's love is constant. He's got constant love. And so, God reached down to mankind, loving mankind who did not want Him, who rejected Him. He sent His Son to die for those who rejected him, did not want him. He did it anyway because of his great love. And what did he do? He justified, redeemed many. And so that is the bottom line answer uh, to rejection. But now everyone God created 
Satan hates. You know, a lot of times we, we just think, oh, Satan, you know, he's the guy in the red suit with the long red tail, horns on his head and a pitchfork. That's not an accurate character here of uh, Satan. I can tell you what Satan's like. He'd probably be a mixture of uh, Ronald Reagan, a uh, mixture of um, people that everybody likes, Bob Hope, just people that you say, I like him. Satan is that good. Uh, you don't believe it. Look what's going on in our world system now which is controlled by Satan. Satan is not spooky. Satan is the wisest, most beautiful, angelic creation of God the Father. And so, that one that I just described hates what God has created. You see, when it comes to love, love is powerful. We could sit here and read uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. And when you get through reading, you say, wow, love is everything. That is a major thing that Satan wants to block. He wants to mix it up, change the atmosphere, smoke screen, nip it when it comes to love. See, love prevents Satan from creating an environment which he can control. And so what does he do? He goes into a family, goes into a church, goes into any kind of an organization. And what does he do? He begins to cause strife. He begins to cause all kind of problems. Why? Because that squelches love. And he knows that the Holy Spirit of God can't work through carnal or either lost people, carnal people, because when there is an atmosphere of love and when people are free to walk in who they are in Christ, my friend, I want to tell you, it's like sunshine to flowers, rain to flowers, Everything begins to just turn toward God and just come up like this. Satan cannot work in that kind of environment, so he does something to knock out the love, to cause strife, and I want to tell you his chief tool is rejection. Because if he can ever get someone rejecting someone, my friend, it spreads like wildfire And when it comes to people and uh, relationships that we have. And so... Satan builds his kingdom upon rejection, and he uses fear and control to get what he wants. That brings us to Abiding Well Rejection, part three tonight. I'm going to go right into it. Number one, characteristics of people who feel rejected. It's going to take me a long time to get through this, but I'm determined I'm going to do it because I think it's so important. I'm going to list a whole lot of characteristics of people who struggle with rejection. And then I'm going to talk about how rejection is affects people in different stages of their life, from the unborn right on up to the senior citizen. Number one, characteristics of a person who feel rejected. Number one, there's an overemphasis on dress. Uh, they, they begin to copy the customs, the dress, the ideas, and behavior patterns of a particular group. They look around them and they say, wow, I sure would like to be like them. And so they study what they wear so that they can be just like them. What's going on in their mind is this. I must be approved by certain others to feel good about myself. And so they begin to be controlled not by the Holy Spirit, not by this vision of I'm in Christ, but they begin to be controlled by something, by human beings who are expiring just like they are expiring. And so what's happening is they are believing Satan's lie. And my friend, this is what Satan's lie is. This is Satan's lie. Listen to this. Self-worth equals performance and other people's opinions. In other words, to feel good about myself, I'm going to strive, I'm going to work, I'm going to save, I'm going to educate myself, I'm going to do whatever I can because if I can perform enough, and if I can meet up to what other people expect of me and their opinions of me, then I can finally feel uh, accepted. But the truth is this. When have you done enough? Nobody knows. How much power and prestige do you need? Power and prestige can't buy you one cup of coffee. Fame and fortune is nothing the only thing that matters is being dead center of the will of God. And so there's an overemphasis on dress. A second thing is this, another characteristic 
is can't live up to their own expectations. That is, they allow other people and other people's influence, they allow them to set this high bar that's in their mind and emotions. They're trying to achieve something. And sometimes you say, well, tell me exactly what it is you're trying to achieve. They don't even know what it is, but I want to give you an illustration. I was in Atlanta, Georgia, going to a John Maxwell leadership seminar, and a woman walked to the podium. It was her time to speak, one of the speakers of many, and this is what she did. She walked to the podium, and she said this. I want all of you to be honest, absolutely honest with yourself uh, this afternoon. I want you to raise your hand. I want you to think about this for a minute. How many of you, if you really think about it, are living out your mother or your father's dream that they had of themselves. She stopped and she waited a long time. And man, hands slowly started going up all over this Colosseum. And then she began to explain how many people had been programmed by mom and dad and mom and dad didn't even know they were doing it. They could feel in their feelings Mom and dad saw this for themselves, but mom and dad never felt that they made it, and I'm going to. It's projection is what it is. And so, people get to a point where they can't live up to their own expectations, and you were, if you were to say clearly define what your expectation is, they can't tell you. Why? Because it started when they were little boys and little girls. Ladies, be careful, and men, be careful. Not to live through your children. A third characteristic of people who feel rejected is they can't trust themselves, so they can't trust God. In other words, I've got this this unseen expectation that I'm striving toward. I don't really believe I'm going to meet it. I don't trust myself that I can. And that goes right into I can't trust God. I can't trust God. And so a person who feels rejected, they can't trust themselves, so they can't trust God. And so deep down inside, they feel like a failure. And I can remember a time in my life because of feeling like a failure. I can remember a time I caught myself slowing down in a ball game to let somebody tackle me. And I was way ahead. And I was fast. And I was slowing down because I didn't believe I deserved to go over the goal line. A person who sees themselves this way, my friend, they will absolutely sabotage uh, success in their life uh, and in their future. And they'll do that to people around them also. A fourth characteristic you see is they can't love themselves, so they can't love others. You see, in their minds, they don't measure up. They don't feel worthy to be loved, can accept or give love. A person like that, you tell them, you did a good job. Oh, it was just, just give all the glory to God. Glory to God. Man, I just want to shake them and say, God lives in you, man. And you're saying, you're doing a great job by abiding in Him. And it's okay to feel good about it. But a person who, uh, can't love themselves, so they can't love others, uh, they don't feel worthy to be loved. They can't accept. They can't give love. Another characteristic, number five, is self-protection. They appear to be aloof, but they are really protecting themselves from the potential of being rejected. Have you ever been with someone or been around someone and they they were just aloof? I mean, uh, like someone said, the woman had her nose so high in the air, if it had rained, she would have drowned. A lot of times the reason people project aloofness is because they don't know what to do with themselves. And they're trying to protect themselves from being rejected. So sometimes a person who feels rejected uh, can come across as aloof because they're protecting themselves. Number six, they can give others gifts, but they cannot give themselves. If you say, look, I don't want your gift. I just want you. They will absolutely cave in. They would rather deflect themselves, giving themselves to you and say, here, here's the gift. And I can tell you something else. A person who struggles with 
rejection. When you give them a gift, you watch them. They will look for a way not to receive it directly from your hand. In other words, they'll say, oh, thank you so much. Lay that right there. I'm busy doing this right now. Thank you so much. But they will not just take it directly from your hand. It's because they don't feel worthy to get your gift. And so they have a hard time receiving it. A characteristic of people who feel rejected, number eight, is they have a very critical spirit. You see, they feel other people are critical of them, but it's just in their imagination. They have been rejected. It's in their emotions. They feel this way, and they see rejection where it's not. So a lot of what they feel is just in their imagination. But they feel that other people are criticizing them. And since they feel criticized by others, they criticize back, and they usually criticize in the areas where they feel inadequate. And so this creates a negative atmosphere around their life and wherever they go. They walk in a negative critical spirit, and this is the absolute opposite, my friend, of walking in the spirit. And so, number nine, another characteristic is feelings of inferiority. Growing up, they should have made A's. Made A's, they should have made A pluses. Should have been on the football team, should have been a starter, and should have been most valuable player. And so this is what they feel. I never felt like I could ever please 100% my mom, my dad, my football coach, my pastor, anybody expecting anything of me, I feel like I could never measure up to them. And so they just feel inferior. And they'll grow up thinking they can't please their spouse. They can't please their own children. And so finally one day they just give up and what do they do? They disengage. Why? It's self-protection. They disengage because I can't stand this feeling anymore. And so they just completely just disengage. I basically, I can't win. I can't be accepted. I got to have some relief. So disengage. A lot of times that happens. Number 10. Another characteristic you see is anger. Now, a lot of times you don't see this anger so much outwardly. It's stuffed deep inside of them. Frustration leads to anger. Anger leads to resentment. And resentment leads to depression. And these kind of people, they defile many who are in their life. Number 11, another characteristic, is perfectionism. I must do it exactly right in order to feel good about myself, whether it's my clothes, my house, my car. My friend, think about this. Apart from God, what's perfect? Nothing on this earth is perfect. It's chasing the wind. You can't get into some type of a perfect state this side of heaven on earth. It's a trap because nothing is perfect. And so if you find yourself living with someone who's in this rejection syndrome, what you do is never enough and you will never be able to please them. Why? It's because they can't accept themselves. No matter what you do, it's not quite enough. No matter what you do, you can't please them. And the reason is not that you're inferior because you've done a good job. The reason is they can't accept themselves. And so really the issue is not so much you, it's them and them accepting their acceptance of themselves. And so they really believe that the rejection either they've been through, the rejection that they think that they're in, they really believe that it's all real. And they believe the opinions of others And so, therefore, they're in this rejection syndrome. They just can't function like a normal human being. And so they will pull you and dominate you, listen, in their personal pursuit for perfection and acceptance. And still, they never get there. I learned a lot of these things from a book called The Ins and Outs of Rejection from Charles Solomon and I. Everywhere I go, I put this book on the book table because I want people to buy the book because everybody struggles with what I'm talking about. And I'm not even near finished yet. I got a lot more. 
I'm telling you what, my friend, rejection is a common thread that goes through every human being that's ever lived on the face of this earth. It is a major, major issue. Most counseling sessions that you might ever have with a friend or family member, you just write on a notepad on your office table, rejection. Put an underline around it and listen to it. Say, all right, share with me what it is that you're here for today. Within less than a minute, you'll be begin to see where the rejection, the self-rejection, goes straight to the symptoms they're talking about. What they'll talk about is symptoms. You take the symptoms, you draw it back to rejection. And then, of course, you've got to take them to the cross to help them understand their acceptance, but I'm coming to that. When you're dealing with this person, it could be a uh, child dealing with mom and dad. It could be... Mom and dad dealing with a child. It could be a husband dealing with wife. Wife dealing with a husband. It could be a congregation dealing with a pastor. It could be a pastor dealing with families in the congregation. I'm telling you, it's everywhere you look. But this is what happens. A person struggling with this in their pursuit of dealing with this rejection that they don't even understand, they begin to involve you in their life Your time, your finances, your influence, they begin to involve you in their personal pursuit of finally coming to this place where I'm accepted, I've arrived. And the next thing you know, codependency develops. If you're not careful, you'll get in a codependent relationship and you'll lose a part of your life and you'll wonder, where did that part of my life go? And so. Sometimes these people who are suffering are striving for what's perfect and there's nothing perfect. Then 12th thing is this. Sometimes there, and I've kind of alluded to it already with aloofness uh, in one of the points there, but number 12, superiority. There's an attitude. And what they convey, they're trying to cover up their own inferiority. So they, they come on strong and they come on as superior. But what it is, they really feel inadequate. And when a person is doing this, sometimes they come on very strong. They come on very loud and outgoing. They have what's called a raucous, nervous habit of laughter. And what it is, is they don't even know they do this. But as Dr. Solomon says, it's like they feel so much rejection and self-rejection that when they're looking at you and talking to you one-to-one as an individual or as a group, They feel that you see this rejection in them. And so the coming on strong, being out loud, outgoing, raucous, laughing when there's no place to laugh is like creating a sideshow for you to watch while the real me stands over here. Does that make sense? When Dr. Solomon showed us this, I thought, oh, my word, that's so good. But it's like they create a sideshow over here and then they step back and, and try to convince you that's the real me right there. Well, you know, immature people say, well, they're just fakes and they put on the church face and and they do. No, that's not what they're doing. Their coping is what they're doing. Thirteen, they're easily hurt. People who have this rejection and they walk in this rejection syndrome, they're very easily hurt. Their antennas are always up. They're expecting to be hurt. Uh, They wear eyeglasses. They look through lenses of hurt. Whether it's there or not, doesn't make any difference. My antenna's up, somebody's about to hurt me, and they see hurt where it's not. They see rejection when there is none. And the more you love them, the more uncomfortable they become. And they will do something to make you reject them. It validates what they suspect, that you really don't like them. And the truth is, they are hard to like. It's hard. They feel good when you reject them. You say, that's strange. I agree it's strange. But they actually like it when you reject them. Why? Because this, aha, I knew you didn't like me. Well, my goodness, for 33 years, you've been trying to push my button and I finally let you. You say, I knew it. They're wanting the other person to finally blow up reject them. Why? It's because that's my identity. That 
validates what I feel. That's my security blanket. This is what I'm really comfortable with. Listen, a person or a family who has this kind of atmosphere comes into a local church, they cannot stand it when there's love and grace. They think, wow, I want it. I don't deserve it. Huh, they're rejecting me. They think they're better than me. And there was never any rejection. There was love and there was grace. But because they're uncomfortable in that environment, they stir up rejection and they don't always know that they do it. It's a form of bondage is what it is. You see, rejection is a family thing. And so, people who struggle with rejection, they're very easily hurt. And they'll do things to make you reject them, to validate what they feel. I'll tell you something else. Uh, You take a message like this, and a person who struggles with it, they hate a message like this. You know why? It's like having your clothes taken off, and you're standing there naked. Nobody likes that. And so, a person who suffers from this rejection, they're easily hurt. And then, there's number 14, there's self-isolation. That is, they want to be with you, but they like the security of isolation. And when they are by themselves, the only person who can reject them is themselves. They're hard on themselves. And so, this kind of person, will again, they'll push you to reject them so that they can justify them going into isolation. They say, well, I went into isolation because of you. But the fact is, they pushed you to reject them. And finally you did, and then they go into isolation. All of us have been and will be rejected by others, but we do not have to accept the feelings that come with it. Your self-worth is not based on other people's opinion of you. It is based on your position in Christ Jesus. Uh, People's opinions change. But your position in Christ Jesus never changes. It can't change. And my friend, that is the answer. Fifteenth, and I've mentioned it before, but it's depression. A person that's suffering uh, from rejection and self-rejection, they know they have failed. They did not meet up to your expectations. You should have married someone else. You should have been uh, friends with this other person. And they just get into this depression. Number sixteen. They have suicidal thoughts. Not always, but they can have suicidal thoughts. 17, self-verification. They're trying to measure their worthiness over and over again, and they're just in an absolute trap of trying to verify uh, themselves. And then again, uh, there's the emphasis on the material. If you don't have fulfilling relationship, you have to have things, spending sprees, hoarding are all signs of a person that struggles with rejection. Uh, They can also uh, move into being very sensual. Because they cannot love and be loved, they develop a sensual attitude. They fantasize, watch movies, to project themselves into. You can do that with reading love stories, watching movies, whatever. You project yourself into, not so much for the sexual experience, but what they're seeking through the movie, through the book, They're seeking to project themselves into it and find and feel acceptance through the watching, through the reading, instead of a real relationship with another person. Uh, They can also be very domineering. Rejection is a form of control. If you're married to someone or if you've got someone in your life that struggles with this, they can come on very domineering. And the reason is this. Because they've opened themselves up enough to let you be their spouse, what they have to do is, and they don't even know they do this, but they have to dominate and control you to protect what environment you get them in. And so they will sabotage meaningful relationships with other people in your life because that woman makes me feel uncomfortable. So therefore, they will fake illness 
They will fake all kinds of headaches. Oh, I'm just too busy. I'm just too tired. What it is, is if there's going to be any place that you may go where that person feels I'm going to be rejected, they're going to look for some way not to have to go. And the next thing you know, how does that affect a family? Next thing you know, there's loss of opportunity begins to happen in that family because of one person. The children do not experience what they could have experienced if they could have spent some more time with that family's children or whatever. But the spouse or someone else in another uh, type of relational situation begins to protect themselves from rejection by sabotaging potential meaningful relationships. And so I want to move on now to those were characteristics of a person who suffers from self-rejection. I want to move on now to a rejection in the different stages of life. And I want to start with the unborn. I don't completely understand this, but Christian psychologists say that a baby in the mother's womb can begin to experience rejection somehow in the mother's womb. Uh, the stress of the mother during pregnancy. Uh, if the mother struggles with feelings of rejection and is tense and, and awkward, somehow or another that baby feels that. Sometimes it's substance abuse, of course. A mother's rejection of the unborn is subtle, but uh, but the child feels it. In other words, I you know what, I, I just didn't mean to have this baby and, and all this stuff. And next thing you know, that child begins to feel the sense of, you know what, I, I wasn't planned for, I wasn't wanted, I wasn't expected. And so there's rejection of the unborn. There's also rejection in childhood. Spontaneity and creativity. When a child knows I am loved and accepted by mom and dad, they're spontaneous. They're very creative. But if a child grows up in a home with a mom and dad who's distant, who struggles with rejection, self-rejection in their own life, they don't feel loved and accepted as a person. They begin to be driven at an early age by a desire to be accepted and loved. So if that child doesn't have the normal love and acceptance from mom and dad, it jolts into them at an early age to try to get acceptance, to try to get love, and the next thing you know, you begin to have problems with that child. And what's happening is they're craving for someone love me, accept me with who I am. Of course, they don't understand what's happening to them, and so... A child who is starving to know he's loved and accepted will either act out or they'll act in. If they're acting in, it could be a quieter child who never gets into trouble. They stuff their frustration inside and later it comes out in marriage, surprising everyone. If they act out, there is more open and displays of anger and the child is considered a troublemaker in the classroom. Another stage of life is Rejection as a teenager. As a young person begins to develop his personality, apart from his parents, he naturally gravitates to his peers for interpersonal relationship. An unhealthy relationship with his parents, listen to this, will result in an inordinate dependence upon his peers for acceptance and meaning. My friend, You want to know what's wrong with our nation? I just told you. What's wrong with our nation is this. Most homes in our nation have been severed by divorce. Not once, not twice, three to four times. It's unbelievable. I dealt with a man down in Cleveland who had multiple divorces. What is happening is this. Children don't want that to happen. It frustrates that child. I want to be with daddy. I want to be with mama. But they live in two different places and they have to farm me out to one another back and forth naturally they're going to feel uh, rejected. They're they're not going to feel loved and accepted. And what goes off with inside of them like an alarm clock is, what do I have to do to get accepted and loved? Immediately, instead of just being a normal child learning and growing, they're getting put in this rejection syndrome where they begin to crave to be accepted, crave uh, to be loved. They can't find it. And so they begin to naturally look around To someone who will accept me and love me. So guess what happens? A homosexual or a lesbian comes along. What do they do? They show them gobs of acceptance. And even though they don't even have that 
inordinate desire in them for that. Because they want to be loved, they want to be accepted so badly that they bend uh, to the wishes of that man or woman. And you say, how could that have happened to him? How could that have happened to her? Their family is the exact opposite of that. I'm, I'm talking about it right now. They can't explain it, but I can tell you, if you could listen to them talk freely, you could just write it right down under this rejection. I'm telling you, it's powerful. What it is, I'm so willing to be accepted and f- some kind of a feeling of love that I'm willing to compromise and go into their lifestyle to feel accepted. You think about our inner cities. Why in this world would a young boy to be initiated? I mean, a teenage young boy to be initiated into some gain in these inner cities when the initiation requires rape and murder of a woman why in the world would a teenage boy agree to it when deep inside of him god put it in him that that is wrong this is the reason why i want their acceptance that's what motivates them and if you don't think this is a big deal you look at our inner cities i'm telling you It is infested with everything I'm talking about now. Sometimes I think it's over. It's so bad. Apart from a spiritual awakening, my friend, it is over. It's that many generations that have already been involved in everything that I'm saying now. It's so deep-rooted that now the garden of humanity is nothing but one big breeding, brooding rejection. And the only thing that's going to ever bust all this apart is the Holy Spirit of God regenerating the heart of man, and somebody telling people how to walk by the Spirit and let the Holy Spirit control their mind, their will, and their emotions and push away this rejection with the acceptance that you have because you've been co-crucified with Christ. There's no other answer. Pills wear off. Drink wears off. Movies wear off. Music wears off. Nothing will win over this except I'm in Christ. And Christ is in me. That is it. There's nothing else that's going to help with this. And so, a teenager with a healthy self-image will begin to merge into adulthood and be a productive citizen and good father or mother to their children. Other teenagers, listen to this, will identify with a person who is successful in sports or music. Some young people, knowing they cannot make it in sports, cannot make it in music, Although that's all their peers seem to put on a pedestal and admire sports star, music star. Well, I'm not, can't sing and I sure can't play sports. So what do they do? They throw themselves into studies and they get one master's degree and two and three and doctorates. And the next thing you know, they become professional students and they sit around at Starbucks with a ponytail. And what are you, what are you doing? Well, I'm studying for another exam. Well, I thought you were doing that the last time I saw you 27 years ago. And they become professional students. What it is? They're hiding out because they can't live in a society and just be a normal person because of these feelings of rejection. And so they just become a professional student. And then other uh, kids like me didn't finish their education until later in life. Uh, they so fear failure that they drop out. And what begins to be an escape from failure leads to a prison of sabotaging the future in terms of employment and higher levels of relationship where moving forward is encouraged and expected. And so this person finds themselves more comfortable with others who fear failure and they live their lives trying to explain away the success of my brother, my sister, my uncle, my aunt, my mom and dad. They try to explain all their successes away because why? I feel like one big fat failure and other people who are successful make me feel rejected. No, they don't. You feel rejected by what you see in their success. And so they get an environment. They're in a family. They hold the whole family down to what they feel. They get into a church. They try to hold the whole church family down to how they see themselves and what they feel in their emotions. Why? Because if you bring someone in that sees something different that's a little bit higher level, I feel rejected by that. But you're not rejected. You feel rejected going all the way back to when you're a child 
and you're just allowing that to control your whole future is what happens. And so teenagers need to be very careful that as soon as possible, they need to know who they are in Christ. And then there's rejection in the middle age years. Listen to this. By the time a person reaches his 40s, it begins to dawn upon him that he's going to make his goals, has already achieved them, or that the goals will never be realized. In either case, he is faced with an identity crisis, which some call the midlife crisis. If you made your goals, you lose your drive. You begin to see your physical limitations. I'm getting older. Change of career is out of the question. Why? Because of family responsibilities. If a person has not found their identity in Christ, he will bury himself in something for his significance. When business or career goals are attained or unattainable, and the children have left the nest, extramarital affairs are right to happen. Got to be careful during those years. You show me a man that comes out of seminary, and he's got a vision of an American church filled with several thousand people. That's what you're going to come out of Bible college and seminaries with. It's just what you're going to see. It's what you're going to learn. It's what you're going to hear about. It's what's labeled as success. You show me a man who does not know who he is in Christ Jesus. And he has that image of that in himself and that. And he strives after, gets in his 40s and realizes that's not going to be for me. I'll show you a man who's going to go down. He's either going to go down and get out of ministry or he's just going to go through the motions. And listen, when that happens, listen to me carefully, church. When that happens, he goes into a maintenance mode. And I've told you this will be the fourth time now. Never call a minister to pastor this church who's in a maintenance mode. It'll be the beginning of the end for this church. Okay? You got that? Fourth time I've said it. Don't do that. You'll be careful. Number one, you want your minister to know who he is in Christ. So that his self-image and his significance, even though he may struggle like everybody else does, deep down he says, ultimately all I have is God. I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. God and what God provides for me is all that I need. And so here we go. That's the only way to operate. Then there is the um, rejection in the mature years, senior citizens. They retire with expectations based more on fantasy than reality. They begin to feel like a has-been sometimes, no longer an achiever, remorseful about the past. They begin to have fear of failure. There's a realization they never achieved a balance in life. And there's a realization they have always followed God at a guilty distance. And they began to struggle with these things later in life. So, the bottom line problem is, we live our lives asking ourselves this question, what must I do to get people to accept me? What must I do? And so, instead of knowing who you are in Christ, you find yourself striving and believing devil's lies that performance and other people's opinions of you equals significance, success, or whatever you want to call it. Now, how do you deal with all this? How do you deal with this jumble? How do you deal with the feeling of belonging? This is it. I'm accepted in Christ. How do you deal with feeling of worthiness? Listen to this. You say, I'm just not worthy. My friend, Jesus died for you. Do you realize the worth that is? The Bible says that you and I are His workmanship. That word means poem. We are people of notable excellency. The Bible teaches that we are trophies of His grace. That means God the Father can say, Hey, look, angels, look at them. I didn't die for you, but I died for all of them. Even when they rejected me and didn't want me, alienated from me, died for them anyway. Trophies of His grace. And then what about feeling inadequate? 
See, the emotions make you feel inadequate. But if you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit lives in you. My friend, you're as adequate as a human being could be on this earth. I don't care where you are. You're adequate. You have to see that in Christ, I belong. I'm accepted in Christ. Feeling unworthy? Jesus died for me. That makes me worthy. I feel inadequate. But the Holy Spirit strengthens me. So I am adequate. But if I continue to base my self-worth on the opinions of others, I will continue to feel rejected where there is none. And I will continue to reject other people. This is very true. Listen, if you feel these things, you say, I struggle with some of this. You also struggle with rejecting others, though you may not be aware of it. And so, here's three steps to overcome this. One is simply identify the feelings of rejection. You can do this privately. You don't have to do it publicly. Just simply say, I feel rejected. But remember, God never rejects you. You say, I feel that God rejects me. The reason you feel that God rejects you is because people have rejected you in the past. And you projected that rejection on God. God is, He transcends all that I'm talking about now. God transcends all of that. And so, you identify the feeling of rejection and just be honest with yourself. I feel rejected. But remember, God only rejected one. He was His Son. The only time God rejected a human being was when he turned his back on his son, who was our substitute and became our sin. He rejected his own son on your behalf and mine. He said, what about all those people who don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? I believe with all my heart that when Jesus died, he died for every person. And the acceptance, the security, the atoning work of Jesus is all available. But those who never received it, It's not that they're rejected by God. They've rejected themselves by not receiving the acceptance that's been extended. God rejected Jesus. He's not going to reject you, my friend. So identify the feelings of rejection. Number two, reject those feelings of rejection. In other words, if if somebody says, well, I tell you what, uh, you ignoramus, I don't like you. I don't like what you said. Well, what did I say? You said that uh, everybody that didn't make A's is stupid. You know what? I did say that. Hmm. I was so wrong. I should have never said that. But will you forgive me? I'll never forgive you for saying that. I agree with you. I was wrong. I should have never said that. Uh, Please forgive me. And they said, I'll never forgive you. Well, you've done all you can do. So, you accept the acceptance you have in Christ because of the blood of Christ on the cross and the fact that you've been baptized into Christ and you just have to reject their rejection because you can't do any more. So, you say, well, Chris, how do you handle uh, when people reject you as a pastor? I'm talking about it tonight. I see it for what it is. First of all, what helps me is I expect it. (laughs) And then when it comes, I think, "Uh uh-huh. I knew it was coming. Chris, are you pushing people's button to reject you? I'm not trying to. I'm just being who I am in Christ, pastoring, and I know it's just going to happen. And so when I feel rejected, that pushes my button to say, yeah, but I'm in Christ. (laughs) Yeah, but I'm in Christ. And I've said that uh, over and over for many years now. Yes, but I'm in Christ. So reject those feelings uh, of rejection. Remember, no weapon formed against you uh, shall prosper. And forgive any person who's rejected you. And show them a new measure of grace. And if you've done wrong, deal with it. Get it over with. Based on what God's Word says about me, His child, and I take God's Word, and by His Holy Spirit, I reject this rejection. I choose death to rejection. Because I've been crucified with Christ. I am dead to rejection. And then put your full focus on God. 
Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things on earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And then affirm, affirm to yourself over and over again, I am unconditionally loved. I am completely forgiven. I am totally accepted. I am complete in Christ. This is the biblical answer to rejection. And live your life giving generously to others. Give them your time, your presence, your attention, genuine compliments, and a listening ear. Now, what I just said at the end, you've heard before. Neil Anderson has used it over the years. Dr. Solomon has used it. There's many other people who've used it. You say, just affirm to yourself over and over again that uh, I'm unconditionally loved, completely forgiven, totally accepted, and I am complete in Christ. And there's about ten others I could have listed. Now, most of you have seen this somewhere. It probably is in Milk to Meat somewhere. It, it ought to be. If, I'm sure it is. This is the issue right here. I've heard that over these years. I've been to the seminars. I've seen this. I, I, I saw this on a video. I first realized this in, in Search of Significance. It's one of the, a great book to read. I know that. But somehow or another, I know this, but it's, it hadn't helped me. This is the reason what I talked about in this three-part message is that word rejection. See, rejection affects the emotions. You can fill your mind full of the facts, the verses of the Word of God. But your emotions will block you from appropriating all the spiritual truth that you have in your mind. In other words, it's almost like you're needing to download, but you can't download it from your head to your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's like a block. And I'm telling you, rejection is the reason. It's the block that's keeping everything that you've learned since you were a little girl, a little boy, from downloading to begin to affect the soul, the mind, the will, and emotions. The rejection is... What's causing that to stop? You say, well, what's the answer to it? Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm unconditionally loved. I'm fully accepted. Yeah, that's it. Okay, now, why am I all those things? Why, why am I fully loved? Why am I completely accepted? This is why. Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. Not only did he die for you, he died as you on the cross. So picture yourself in Christ like this. Here you are, here Christ is. When he died on the cross, you died on the cross. When he was buried, you were buried. When he was raised, you were raised. When he ascended to heaven, you ascended with him. When he sat down by the right hand of the Father, you sat down with him. And so there Christ is. Here you are in Christ. Here God the Father is. When God the Father looks at God the Son, he sees you in Christ Jesus, fully pleasing to him. Fully accepted, unconditionally loved, not 97%, 100%. People on earth, you're lucky if you get 33%. Your position in Christ, 100%. On earth, this is temporary. We're expiring. This position here is forever. You say, what about my emotions, though? They're, they're still, I'm stuck on stupid. Paul said, be ye therefore transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do I transform the renewing of my mind? Let the Holy Spirit do it, number one. And you do it by the Word of God. Keep listening to these sermons, taking notes, pay attention to your Sunday school class teacher. When you learn something, a principle, apply it, walk in it by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you what's going to happen is your mind is going to be renewed. Keep seeing yourself in Christ at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Keep seeing yourself that way until 
it becomes more natural for you to think of yourself this way. And that way, when you feel rejection, it reminds you of this. Because if you don't think this way, when you are rejected from other people, I want to tell you, if you don't think this way, you're going to begin to have a major problem inside of you, a major battle. Not only is it going to affect you, it's going to affect everybody in your family and everybody in your life. And so, I'm crucified with Christ, buried with Him, raised with Him, seated with Him, been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Bill Clinton, when he was a young boy, he went to Washington, D.C., to the White House. He said, I wanted to shake the hand of the President of the United States, who was John F. Kennedy. So he said, I got there, we made all the arrangements, and I was one of the ones, I waited in a long line and standing in front of the White House. He said, I walked up to John F. Kennedy, looked up at him, and shook his hand. And when I shook his hand, I made a purpose in my mind. I will be just like this. And he did it. And he even admits his affairs, his extramarital affairs, is all rooted in being like John F. Kennedy. That is a substitute for thinking this way. I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. Amen. You've been listening to Abiding Above Ministries with Chris Hodges. If you would like Chris to speak at your church or event, please go to our website, abidingabove.org. God bless you and make you a blessing.